All right, thank you for having me. Uh, good morning. So I am a Mohs surgeon. A Mohs surgeon is uh, primarily trained as a dermatologist with additional training in both pathology and surgery. So when we approach a skin cancer, we approach it with the skills of dermatology to look at the skin and see the changes in the skin, surgically be able to remove that and look under the microscope and identify what the tumor is. So I'm also a gardener. And uh, the analogy that I use to explain skin cancers is a lot like plants. I always talk about weeding the tumors out like we weed the plants in the backyard. An aspen is a tree that can reproduce by two ways. It can reproduce by its roots in which it extends through the skin, and it can reproduce by seeds. And there are certain cancers like basal cell carcinoma that predominantly spread by the roots. And so they lend themselves to Mohs surgery very well because if you start from the trunk, you can chase the roots out and find all the tumor. There are other cancers like Merkel cell that more often are seeds. And so even if you've got a tiny little spot on the lip, whatever local control you do for that one weed, there's going to be a high probability that that has already spread seeds to other places in the body. Melanoma straddles the fence. Melanoma in its most common form is limited to one spot, and in its most aggressive form, it has seeds. So how do we know which melanoma you have? We have staging guidelines that look at multiple features of the melanoma that help us identify whether it's more likely to be stage zero, melanoma in situ, or stage four, and it already has demonstrated that it is in other organs, metastasized to other sites. And Mohs is most indicated for that which is local, so the in situ. And there's, uh, we can get into a good four hour debate uh, this morning if we want to talk about which additional melanomas need to have Mohs as they progress from superficial to slightly invasive to a little bit more invasive. Uh, that's, the talk today is going to be talking a little bit about the technical limitations of what Mohs does and how that debate has evolved over the last uh, 40, no, 80 years. All right, so if you want to go look at some guidelines that were most recently published by dermatologists, we just published this in January in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, which is guidelines for treating primary melanoma. So when a melanoma is initially identified on the surface on your hand, that is called the primary, and there's no evidence of metastasis. This guidelines, these guidelines are there to understand how we should approach the staging and how we should approach the treatment of melanoma. In those guidelines, we have MMS, as short for Mohs surgery, is the bottom of this page, and it says, Mohs for melanoma in situ, lentigo malignant type, is strength of recommendation B. So it's not A. We're not saying this is something that everyone needs to have for uh, melanoma in situ limited to the surface. There's B level of evidence, which means there's a debate. So when should we do MOS? When tumors are not just local, but they're contiguous. So that root needs to be connected to the trunk. Why should we do MOS for that contiguous tumor? Because if you have a Mohs approach, you can histologically define the margin and leave as much normal skin as possible while being as exhaustive in your search for the roots of the tumor. And for locally aggressive cutaneous malignancies, this approach with Mohs surgery has the highest cure rates. So when did this all begin? Frederick Mohs is why we have the name Mohs associated with this approach. Uh, there has been the MOHS, microscopic oriented histologic surgery made up uh, to make sense of why we call ourselves Mohs surgeons, but Fred is the reason we're Mohs surgeons. Back in 1930, Fred was a medical student and he was uh, approaching this problem of how this disease, which is so often local, was causing problems for the patients with both basal cell, squamous cells, and melanoma. And he was looking for a better approach than just cutting it out and sending it to a pathologist to tell us what it is. And in his initial work, he developed this technique, which is called the fixed uh, processing technique, in which he would put this 
paste onto the tumor, and over 24 hours, the paste would soak in and plasticize the tumor and the surrounding skin. Uh, it was anesthetic, so it didn't hurt. It was hemostatic, so it wouldn't bleed. And the patients would come back the next day, and he would sharply remove the tumor, slide it onto glass, and look to see if there was any roots of tumor on the edges of what he took out. And if you saw any roots, he put on more paste. They came back the next day, and they would continue this until there was no evidence of roots extending from the center. And this was uh, improved upon in 1950 when he approached the eyelid and saw that he couldn't put paste on the eyelid without uh, making people blind. And so he developed another t technique with just frozen sections, which is uh, where you take the tissue out and you freeze it immediately. And within 30 minutes, you can get slides that say there's tumor on the edge or there's not tumor. And this frozen technique is what was popularized in the 1970s and is now uh, why there's 12,000, uh, 1,200, 1,200 Mohs surgeons in the US right now. Um, and you can find a Mohs surgeon in nearly every city. And they're most commonly doing this frozen technique. All right, so we have this a technique to apply to uh, chasing the tumor, and we're looking for tumors with extension. So what are we looking for with our microscope? This is uh, epidermis, skin, human, and you see on the top left, A, is the debulk of melanoma in situ from which we see a lesion on the skin, and we cut out that center lesion, and you look at that, and you can see and arrows appear on this. You got melanoma cells right here. And they're really, really hard to see on frozen sections. And if you process them also with a, a, a paraffin section, which then takes 24 hours, you can have fro frozen sections or formalin sections. The frozens are the immediate ones that we can do really quick. The formalin sections are a 12 to 24 hour processing. And the processing with the formalin gives you a very clear pattern. So you can see the melanomas very clearly with formalin sections. And it's really hard to see them with frozen sections. And uh, so this challenge in seeing the frozen sections was improved upon by using special stains. And we can use special stains that label the melanocytes. Melanocytes are in both normal cells or normal skin, and they're also in skin with melanoma. And when you call something melanoma is when you see the melanocytes behaving badly. So this is an example of melanoma with a MART1 stain, and you see that you've got this proliferation of brown cells. There's a whole lot of brown cells that are clumping up on each other. They're floating up into the upper levels of the epidermis, and they look different than this. This is what normal patterns of melanocytes should look like. You should have one melanocyte for every 37 keratinocytes. It, on cross-section, looks like one for every, 10 derm, uh, for every 10 keratinocytes. And we have some benign patterns in which, on the right, we have a lentigo, which are those little brown sunspots that we get. And when you get those increased proliferations of melanocytes, they can look a little bit more uh, dark brown than what's normal. But Mohs approaching melanoma is looking for this difference. You're looking at normal skin on the left, and you're looking for melanoma, which is this proliferation of these brown cells on the right. So we know what it looks like. The next challenge is how do you decide where, as a surgeon, you're going to remove the skin and how you're going to process it as a pathologist so you can evaluate the edges and identify those cells. And there is basically a different method of approaching this for as many surgeons as there are. There are probably as many methods. And this is a, a kind of busy table that shows the different ways that you can decide to cut it out and take um, margins all around. You can take margins that radially spread from the center. Um, there's many different ways that you can approach it. And if you think about it, you can only pick one. Because once you've picked to go radially, you can no longer go on the outside because you're processing glass slides in each plane. And by committing to that one approach, you can't do the other approach. So hopefully someone's writing a question down now for what did he just say? And I can explain that further later. But in, 
the, in short, I'm gonna explain just one of the techniques and you can only do one. So, this is the approach at the University of Pennsylvania, which is an approach that uh, it's, I view it as one of the more um, conservative approaches where they, uh, they, they have a very wide and deep approach to melanoma, which possibly would give you a greater loss of uh, normal tissue, um, but it's a very thorough, exhaustive approach. And so we'll work from A, and you see that we take a pen, we identify everything that looks like tumor, so if it's brown, red, pink, white, whatever on the surface makes it look like melanoma, we circle that with our pen. We then numb up the site, and we take a blade, and we score the area. This initial score is just there for our uh, pathology review. When we look under the microscope later, we can see that what we thought was brown went to the score, and if we see something extending beyond the score, we know that we're looking at a melanoma that has a a pattern that is going to be subclinical, which means what you saw on the surface doesn't match what we see at the score. So the score should be the wall at which tumor stops, and that's one of the things that we can use to help us chase the tumor. So after we have scored, we then take a margin around that, which is going to be part of our debulk, and this is what we take um, without orientation. We take that out for evaluating the tumor, which I think we do in the next, in bread loaf sections. And the reason you do bread loaf sections is because we're looking to confirm that the initial diagnosis of melanoma in situ is confirmed in our bread loafing on the day of surgery. So you look at multiple slices of that central debulk tissue and look to see if there's any evidence of that pattern, which we expect to see melanocytes clumped up in the epidermis and we're hoping not to see melanocytes leaving the epidermis and invading into the dermis and fat. Next, we go back to the, the, the site of the lesion in which we have debulked from the center and you see fat in the center. And then you take your Mohs margin, which is everything should look like normal skin on the patient. And you're going to cut that out with these hash marks and those hash marks maintain orientation. So we process the slides we can use the hash mark to say we were positive at 12 o'clock and we go back to where 12 o'clock is. We then take that tissue to the lab and this little colorful pattern down here is our grossing and inking. Basically, we, we need to take that bowl of tissue and cut it into sections that allow us to put it flat onto a glass slide. And we need to ink those pieces so that we know when they're on the glass slide that the red side is the base of the, the piece five, and the blue is going to represent six o'clock on the patient. And we need those colors when we're looking at the microscope to say we did see tumor, and tumor was near this orientation. So we look at those five slides of the five representational pieces, and if we see tumor, we go back to where we see it. So this is a slightly old table of comparing Mohs and some of the approaches of Mohs to excisions. It's from a few years ago. I use it because it's nice and simple. And you see that we've got a recurrence rate that was said to be about 20% with just a simple excision. And if you apply some of this margin control uh, technique, you can get better control of local disease. And uh, you see a progression of 20% down to five, down to 0.3 with immunostains versus two without immunostains. So this is a more busy slide to talk about the current state. This is a study from the last uh, year in which we now have experience with Mohs and melanoma that goes back a good 30 to 40 years. And we have a continued debate where we have uh, 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 this challenge of looking at multiple surgeons with multiple techniques, looking at multiple tumors with multiple propensities to be local or aggressively metastatic. And we have data like this in which we look at the SEER database, which is one of the, the, the big national databases. And we look to see who got melanoma treated with Mohs, who got melanoma treated with wide local excision, and how did they compare. And looking at this large uh, patient population, we see the numbers are kind of meh. They're about the same. We can't really say they're much better. We can't really say they're much worse. Um, so 
the cure rate in the large databases don't show a dramatic improvement with the MOS, uh, but we can postulate that potentially this approach would be more tissue conserving. So we might be able to get the same cure rate and also leave an eyelid so we don't need to reconstruct such a large spot. So the remaining challenges to MOS and melanoma, one is the amount of upstaging. So 25% of lesions that were biopsied as melanoma in situ might be found to have invasive disease in the excision. That 25% is the highest range that I've seen. Usually it's uh, dependent on your local pathologist and your relationship to know what they call things. And uh, so a pathologist is gonna have their own interpretation of whether something is melanoma or not melanoma, invasive or not invasive. And you'll have one center that can have a, a success rate of only 5% of their lesions convert to invasive during their excision um, and others that have higher percentages. The second is the criteria for, second challenge is the criteria for uh, determining when the melanoma is no longer melanoma and it's just uh, benign proliferations of melanocyte and sun damaged skin. That is an evolving definition that is also surgeon dependent where some surgeons are uh, more willing to leave atypical cells uh, behind because they think it's benign proliferation and others are more uh, aggressive and go wider. Oh, and going wider would mean you balance your tissue conservation with tumor clearance. So in conclusion, I think of melanoma like an aspen and the disease that looks very benign, relatively benign and in situ is something that I expect to be extending from a local source and uh, applicable to MOS um, and things that have more aggressive features are not likely to be well treated by this local control. Thank you.